In the far-flung future, VRMMO games are all the rage. It's almost as if they never learn from the mistakes of Sword Art Online. One company developed a game so realistic that people hated it. Games should be an escape from reality, not a reminder of it. Ten years have passed. Hero is an ordinary high school student whose track and field career was cut short by an unspecified incident. His teacher, Mr. Yasuoka, attempts to counsel him on his future career path, but Hero loathes his overbearing attitude. On the way home, he runs into his friend, Takafumi. He tries convincing Hiro to hit the gym, but Hiro brushes him off. Hiro hates to be reminded of the incident that destroyed his running career, and he mutters at how much this world sucks. It's about to suck even more. Tanis and Nishina, two bullies at his school, extort him. He heads to his local GameStop to buy his pre-ordered copy of Finalizing Quest 22, the newest VR MMO game. When he realizes that he is 1,000 yen short, he realizes that he must have mistakenly given Tanis and Machina a 10,000 yen bill. Forced to look elsewhere for a copy, he enters a shabby game store named Kizaragi. Unfortunately, the finalizing quest on their shelf is an older version. He asks the beautiful and well-endowed storekeeper, Riona, if they have a copy of the latest one. Instead, she rants about how ridiculous the naming scheme is for finalizing quest and how there's nothing final about it. He sets aside the fact that her chest is huge for now, and he asks her if she has the game. She claims she does, and just for 10,000 yen. Hero hands over the money, but he is the victim of a bait and switch. He instead receives a game called Kiwain Quest, which Riona promises is an adult game based on the ZZ rated sticker. She offers to thoroughly guide him through it, and after Hero remembers that her chest is huge, he says yes. Later, when he realizes that the game is over 10 years old, he almost tosses it. When he arrives home, he accidentally walks into his sister, Cade, in the bathroom. After an awkward exchange, he heads up to his room and fires up Kimwin Quest. It is a standard VR MMO, and Hero is tasked with defeating the Demon Lord and saving the world of Aberdeen. Hero awakens in an exact replica of his body. Despite the game's age, the graphics are impressive and have an immersive feel. He meets his in-game childhood friend, Alicia, who reminds him that they're supposed to help with the apple harvest today. Her brother, Martin, enters and gives him an apple. To his surprise, he can taste it. When he asks for directions to Flora Castle, both Alicia and Martin are horrified. They tell him not to joke around like that, but Hero is genuinely unaware of the danger behind his words. He forcibly tries to leave anyway, prompting Martin to tackle him against the wall. He explains that their city of Ted is surrounded by a huge moat to keep monsters out, and it is forbidden to leave the city without permission. When Hiro insists on leaving, Martin is left with no choice but to punch him into submission. Hiro, tired of being pushed around in real life and in-game, tackles Martin, accidentally killing him with the fruit knife. A horrified Alicia rushes to her brother's side, and Hiro suggests they try some healing herbs. Alicia screams at him, prompting him to run out. Alicia relentlessly chases him across town. While hiding in an alley, Hiro finally encounters Riona, who uses a special character model named Fairy, which renders her invisible to most NPCs. She tells him that this game uses a special title system to track the player's progress. To her dismay, the tag around Hero's neck reads, Best Friend Killer. The game is over before it even began. Hero swears that it was all an accident and that he wants to redo the game. However, Riona tells him that Kawin Quest has no new game feature, and since it has autosave, attempting to reload would simply return him to Martin's death. His only choice is to buy brand new full dive VR equipment. Hero demands a refund, but Rihanna conveniently has a no refund policy. She explains that Kawain Quest is a 10 year old game that was unpopular at launch, but it has a small dedicated player base. She suggests they seek out a player named Genji, who also killed his best friend. Hero starts with 30 gold, which is perfect for getting a new disguise. He'll need it. The entire town is already aware of his crime. She reassures him that merchants will never turn away a customer. Hiro walks into a clothes store and picks out a cloak for 15 gold. The merchant is willing to sell it, but only for 25 gold. To find Jinji, they head over to the local casino. She explains that Ted is a self-sufficient city with the nickname Closed City, due to its policy of not engaging in trade with other settlements. When they near the casino, Hiro is discovered by Alicia. She confesses that she is in love with him, and Hiro is relieved that she's back to normal. She then says that they can both join Martin in the afterlife, and he realizes that she's still nuts. She calls herself the Hell's Fruit Slicer, and Rihanna warns him that Alicia's speed stat is incredibly high for her level. He runs as fast as he can away from the crazy lady, and he rests near a cabin in the woods. He wonders why he's so exhausted, and Rihanna tells him that Kawin Quest recreates fatigue. He receives a new title, 
upgrading his overall title to Running Best Friend Killer. Riona tells him these titles don't serve a real function, they're just there for fun. Hero tries to log out, but Riona tells him that he can't leave while in combat. Alicia must be close by. Alicia discovers Hero and wounds his hand, and he cries out in pain. Riona attacks Alicia's eyes, giving Hero enough time to log out. The next morning he receives a text from Riona, asking him to play again later. Later, Hiro recounts to Takafumi his experience with the game. They laugh about it for a while, but Takafumi advises him to pick up a hobby aside from gaming, as it is generally frowned upon nowadays. He reasons that getting back into running may also keep Tanis and Machina off his back. Later, while contemplating playing Key One Quest again, his sister complains about how loud he was the previous night. When she sees the game cartridge in his hand, she tells him to knock it off or go back to running. Out of spite, Hiro chooses to play a game where someone is trying to kill him. He loads back into Q1 Quest, but the wound on his hand remains. He pulls out some medicinal herbs, but he has no idea how to use them. A drunken man stumbles into the alley and calls Hiro an NPC. Hiro realizes he must be Jinji. He helps Hiro use the herbs, though he warns that it will still hurt over the next few days. They head to the local casino, where Hiro explains his situation. He notices that Jinji seems to be talking to people that aren't there, and Jinji explains that he'll see them soon enough. Jinji tells the story of how he strangled his own best friend to see what would happen if you killed an NPC. Hiro learns that Jinji employed a judo technique to overpower his friend, and Kiwame game uses its player's actual physical attributes. As such, the game is incredibly difficult, and only one person has ever beaten it. A man called Kamui, the never-bested adventurer. He agrees to help Hiro, but in a very roundabout way. He removes Hiro's cloak and announces to the entire casino that the killer is here. Genji wishes him good luck at the interrogation. Guards swiftly arrive to arrest him for the murder of Martin. Amos, the guard leader, shows him the warrant for his arrest, and when Hiro tries to escape, Genji throws him to the ground. He rubs his hands together for a tip, and Amos reluctantly hands over a few coins. He tells Hiro one thing, never admit that he did it. He is led to the town square, where civilians are allowed to throw objects at Hiro. He complains about being injured, but Amos isn't happy about it either. He's here on overtime, and he just wants to rest already. Hiro obediently agrees to keep walking, but he spots Alicia, now lacking an eye, standing atop a building. He asks to be taken to prison right away. Hiro is tossed into a jail cell, where he is prevented from logging out due to the ongoing event. He waits an hour before trying again, but the condition holds. He soon experiences the inconveniences of such a realistic game, such as hunger and the smell of a dirty urinal. Suddenly, Martin's ghost appears, startling Hiro. He demands that Hiro repeat the promise they made together under the Karuna tree, but Hiro has no idea what he means. Martin swears to haunt him until he remembers, and Hiro realizes that Jinji must be experiencing the same thing. Martin vomits blood all over Hiro, and he scrambles to his jail bars and screams for help. A woman named Miza approaches his cell and frees him. She leads him to another room, where Misa asks Hiro if he consents to experiencing something intense. To Hiro, this can only mean one thing. He readily accepts the consent check, and Misa asks him to lay down on the table. Hiro obediently waits for the event to start, but to his surprise, he finds himself in leather restraints, while Misa is in a dominatrix outfit. Misa, a huge sadist, explains that she will be torturing him to exorcise the demon from his body. If he manages to endure it, his crimes will be blamed on the demon, and he will be acquitted. If he confesses to the murder, he will be thrown into prison again. It won't be the fun kind of torture with whips. It'll be the kind with saws and knives. Hiro begs for Rihanna to help, and she finally arrives. She apologizes for being late. He is expecting her to use magic to get him out, but all she does is cheer him on. She explains that this event is necessary to clear his name. Miza relishes the opportunity to cut someone up, and when she makes a small incision on Hiro's thigh, the fear causes him to wet himself. Misa is elated. Suddenly, Amos barges in and cancels the torture, explaining that the captain of the guard himself, Tesla, has ordered it. And Riona praises him for discovering a never-before-seen way of getting out of interrogation. However, Hiro has had enough. He denounces the game, calling it unfun, and logs out, swearing to never play again. Hiro is glad that he didn't wet himself in real life, but he laments that it's happening all over again. A few years ago, Hiro attended his first high school track meet. At the time, his sister, Cade, was still very proud of him. Takafumi tells him that his old rival, Tatsuya, is also coming today. The stands were also filled with talent scouts, making this a very important event. Hiro tries to find the bathroom, and he ends up running into Mike, 
a famous American runner and one of his idols. Mike expects a lot from Hero, especially after learning about all the records he has set. The excitement gets to Hero, and he is unable to use the bathroom. Hero stumbles on the opening dash, and he falls far behind. He digs deep, and he manages to pull ahead, but he ends up tripping. To make matters worse, he wets himself. A spectator jokes that he was running down the track, and now it's running down his leg. Cade tries to give her brother a pep talk, but he doesn't want to hear it, and she runs off crying. He meets Mike again, who tells Hero that he is lacking in mental strength. Weeks passed, and Hero begins playing VR MMO games to cope. Cade is irritated by his late night gaming session, and he retorts that the game sucked anyway, and he plans on selling it. She calls him lame for not only quitting running but also games. She storms off, and his mother tells him that Cade just wants to see her cool brother again. Back in the present, Tannis and Machina march up to Hero. But before they can even say a word, he hands them the money they were planning to extort from him. Takafumi tries to talk to him, but he brushes him off. He also ignores Mr. Yasuoka. Later, he answers Riona's phone call, and he agrees to meet her. He returns to Kizaragi, where he attempts to return Kiwen Quest for a refund. Riona asks him why, and he explains that wetting yourself in a game makes it not fun. He threatens to sell it somewhere else, but she says nobody would be willing to buy a 10-year-old game. She shows him a video interview with Kamui, the only person to have beaten Q1 Quest. She would have liked for Hiro to beat Q1 Quest on his own, but this is better than him quitting. She shows him a tutorial site that Kamui set up, and she convinces Hiro to try it. However, he finds it strange that, even with a tutorial site, no other person was able to beat the game. He soon figures out the reason why. Not only is the tutorial site completely text-based without any art, Kamui also verbally abuses the reader. Kamui's first advice is to perform 500 push-ups and sit-ups every single day. Hiro clicks on the tutorial for the scenario in which he murders his best friend, and Kamui tells him that Alicia's stats have increased tenfold as a result of the murder. Thus, he advises Hiro to fight without fighting. He also checks out tips for dealing with being haunted and having no weapons, and Kamui points out that being haunted is part of the quest, while Hiro supposedly had a sword in his starter room. Riona embraces Hiro from behind and remarks that if another person beats Kiwain Quest, she'd like to marry them. Hiro refuses to lose to her massive chest, but he eventually does. He agrees to play again. That evening, Hiro loads back into the game and he begins from where he wet himself. As he is led out of the torture room, Misa says she'd like to torture him again for fun. When he refuses, she takes his wet sheets for herself. Whatever floats your boat, I guess. As Hiro walks down the hallway, he begins to feel a tinge of regret for playing again. Hiro is led through a dimly lit passage used for prisoner transport. When he emerges, he is brought to the estate of Queen Govern, the ruler of Ted City. Inside, he meets Thundering Tesla, the captain of the guard. He invites Hiro to sit down and reveals that during his investigation, he concluded that Martin's death was an unfortunate accident. Hiro is acquitted of his crimes, but Tesla warns him that Martin's lunatic sister may still be after him. A great weight is lifted from his shoulders, and he digs into his apology lunch. Hiro emerges a free man, but public opinion is still heavily against him, and many believe that he either bribed the guard or pulled some other trick. Hiro is forced to hide. The path back to his house is littered with people who want to beat him, so he still has no access to his sword. Rion asks him how much money he has, but he barely has enough to buy a single herb. She tells him that earning money in Kiwain Quest is the same as earning money in real life work for it or steal it. She spots an old couple whom she thinks could be an easy mark, but Hiro refuses to have any more run-ins with the law. Riona brings him to a back alley request shack, since the actual adventurer's guild would turn him away. The receptionist, an old lady, instantly recognizes Hiro as the murderer. Hiro tries to plead his innocence, but she refuses to believe him. Regardless, she offers him a job that pays 20,000 gold for a month of mining, but he prefers a shorter job duration. She hands him a quest, that pays 100 gold for doing whatever Brian wants for an hour. The woman hands him a whip. Brian is a huge masochist. Hiro refuses the job, and the woman kicks him out. Since Hiro isn't willing to work or steal, the only option left is to borrow. Rihanna brings him back to the casino to meet Jinji. She tells him how Hiro wet himself to get acquitted, which Jinji finds hilarious. However, Jinji refuses to give Hiro any money, and he tells the piss boy to get away from his face. Hiro snaps after being called piss boy, and a brief scuffle ensues. Jinji decides to use his secret weapon, brass knuckles. Hiro pulls his hair, and Jinji pinches his side. However, a ghost of Martin startles Hiro, and he scampers away. 
Jinji tells him that the ghosts of the people he kills sometimes appear for moments and sometimes minutes. Rihanna tells him that perhaps Jinji continues playing this terrible game out of guilt for killing an NPC. Hiro apologizes for his actions, and the two reconcile. Rihanna takes advantage of him being drunk, and convinces Jinji that they made a wager. Jinji hands over all his money. Now that he has enough money, Hiro searches for a shop to purchase smoke bombs. When given a choice between an old man's stall and a cute girl's store, he makes the fastest decision of his life. Hiro only has 60 gold from Jinji's pouch, and the shopkeeper Melissa sells him two smoke bombs for 40 gold. Unfortunately, he pays an additional 10 gold surcharge for the bad rumors surrounding him, and another 10 gold surcharge for the honor of speaking to Melissa. He makes the long walk back home, where he musters the courage to walk into his old room. He picks up the sword, right where Jinji said it would be. However, Alicia suddenly appears, as she had been lying in wait the whole time. He attempts to throw a smoke bomb, not knowing that he's supposed to ignite it first. Alicia begins licking the blade of her dagger, and as she prepares to kill Hiro, someone busts through the window. Misa is here to save her precious bedwetter. Misa reminds Alicia that attacking Hiro would be a direct violation of Tesla's declaration of his innocence. Hiro asks her how she managed to find him, and she explains that she was able to smell his pee a mile away. Hiro is mortified, and Riona admits that she didn't want to tell him about it, but it has a strong, ammonia-like smell. While they are distracted, Alicia tries to take a swipe at him, but Misa pushes Hiro out of harm's way. She doesn't care about Tesla's acquittal. She plans to pretend to be ignorant about it. Misa, a certified executioner, is confident she can swiftly dispatch Alicia. She slams down her blade, but to her surprise, Alicia manages to slip away into the darkness. He tosses her knife out the window, but she simply pulls out two more. Misa comes between him and Alicia, and Hiro sure is glad that she's here to help. When Misa reveals that the only reason she is helping him is so that she can torture him later, Hiro changes his mind. Misa and Alicia enter into an intense duel. Their blades clash together, and the clanging of metal blades fills the room. Misa sneaks in a counter, and she manages to disarm Alicia. However, Alicia takes this opportunity to kick Misa, and she knocks her unconscious, your next hero, Riona tries to buy time for him to escape, but Alicia finally notices that Hiro must have a fairy nearby. She puts on a pair of glasses to defend herself, and it won't end like last time. Hiro recalls Kimui's advice on doing something to throw off his childhood friend, and he arrives at a single answer. He shouts to psych himself up, and he grabs Alicia's chest. Surely such an out-of-the-box tactic should work. It doesn't work, and she kicks him with half her strength, which is enough to send him reeling to the ground. Martin's ghost appears, and Alicia can feel his presence. Hiro realizes that Kimi's advice referred to something entirely different. In a last-ditch effort, he confesses his love for Alicia. This is what finally catches her off guard, and Hiro makes sure he sounds as sincere and genuine as possible. Alicia has always loved him too, but she scorns him for killing her brother, and more importantly, for running away from it. She storms off, and Hiro realizes that he's been thinking about it all wrong. To him, Alicia and Martin were NPCs, but to them, he was a precious childhood friend. He picks up his sword and finds it covered in rust, so Rihanna suggests they see the blacksmith. However, he still has unfinished business, and he sets off for the southern part of town. When he arrives, he wills Martin's spirit to come forward, and he takes his hand. Hero is brought into a flashback of the past, where he sees a younger version of himself playing with Martin and Alicia. To his dismay, his past self is a bumbling idiot who can barely make full sentences. He then sees that his promise to Martin was to always be best friends. He repeats these words to Martin, and his spirit passes on. Hiro is crushed that he wasn't able to bring Martin with him. Riona arrives, who admits that since she couldn't see Martin, Hiro just looked like he was talking to himself like a creepy dude at the park. With the matter resolved, Hiro's title transforms to Best Best Friend Killer. Riona suggests that he get his sword fixed up, and get some fresh pants while he's at it. However, when they return to Ted City, they find it in flames. Riona has never seen such a thing before. Hiro and Riona race into the city, but the civilians are in a panic, and nobody is calm enough to give him an explanation. For now, they go to the blacksmith. Hiro requests to have the rust on his sword removed, but the blacksmith tells him that there's no time for that. The goblins are attacking. Hiro, excited to fight some goblins, asks to have his rust removed. The blacksmith asks if he has potatoes in his ears, and yells at him to do it himself. Hiro walks over to the anvil and uses a whetstone to scrape away the rust, but gives up and decides to use it as a club. Rihanna warns him that goblins are far too powerful for him to defeat, and if he dies in-game, something bad will happen. Hiro's chest swells up, 
and he realizes that if he dies here, he dies in real life. Rihanna tells him that he reads too much manga. The consequence is that when he dies, the game and console break. She recounts that over the years, thousands of warranty claims and official complaints have been filed against the company that made Q1 Quest, but they used every resource at their disposal to sweep it under the rug. Eventually, most of the games were recalled, and it was forever forgotten as a terrible game. Rihanna suggests that he log out for now, but Hiro really wants to see a goblin. He peeks out the door and witnesses a goblin about to attack a young girl. He tries to jump out and rescue her, but Rihanna reminds him that he'll die if he tries fighting. Fortunately, the city guard shows up to her rescue, but one by one, their arms are ripped off by the goblin's bare teeth. Things aren't looking good for the underpaid city guard. Hiro insists on helping anyway, but Rihanna begs him to at least change his pants first. He is reluctant to, but Rihanna says she's been enduring the smell of his soaked pants for hours. The last of the city guards lie dead, and Hiro prepares to execute his rescue operation. Rihanna tosses a small stone to get the goblin's attention, and Hiro makes a mad dash to rescue the girl. Unfortunately, he ends up running into another goblin, and they end up surrounded. Hiro instructs the young girl to run while he stays behind. However, the goblins ignore him and chase after the girl instead. Hiro frantically runs after them, and he suddenly hits super speed, and he manages to reach the girl in time. It doesn't change the fact that the goblins have surrounded him, but like a bolt of lightning, Tesla descends from above and rescues him. Riona excitedly explains that Tesla is the strongest NPC in Ted City. Amos leads the young girl home, and she waves goodbye to Hiro. Tesla invites Hiro to fight alongside the city guard as a temporary mercenary. He readily accepts, despite Riona's misgivings. The next day, Hiro tells Takafumi about Q1 Quest, and how it destroys your console if you die. When he arrives home, he decides to look at Kamui's strategy guide for the Goblin Assault event. There are several ways to leave Ted City including building a strong reputation and earning Queen Govern's permission to leave, but the Goblin Assault complicates things. It is possible to gather NPCs to fight the goblins, hide in a hole, or make a run for it. However, the least feasible way is to join Tesla's city guard as a mercenary, which Kemi says, even for him, is incredibly difficult. Hero's chance of survival, 0.1%. Hero's life, and more importantly, his console, are in danger. Hero forges ahead, though Kinui's pre-recorded message has already written off his chances for survival. However, on the super slim chance that the player has the title of best best friend killer, their chances improve. Hero's eyes light up. Kaomi seems surprised anyone would get the title, but he remarks that their chances just went up from 0.1% to 0.5%. He advises the player to survive up until the second day of the Goblin Assault, and if they can overcome this terrifyingly difficult ordeal, the true mystery of Ted City will be revealed. Kamui gives some final words of encouragement. The chances are slim, but not impossible. For once, Hiro is filled with a steely resolve. He visits Cade's room and gives her a custard cup as an advanced apology for playing loudly. He tells her that for once, he wants to see something through to the end. Cade takes the cup but shuts the door in his face. Hiro returns to Kiwen Quest, where Tesla leads him to the local barracks. But first, they drop by the mansion to meet Queen Govern. She embraces Hiro, and she sultrily encourages him to protect the city at any cost. Riona pokes fun at the strange sounds he made. They arrive at the training grounds, where Hiro is introduced as their newest recruit. There are two others, Granada and Palu. Tesla tells them that the goblins appear to be targeting Queen Govern's mansion, and it is their duty to protect her. Another night, Bob shows them to their rooms. After Hiro gets dressed, Bob picks him up and notices that his slender body is well suited for covered operations. He brings him to the training grounds, where Hiro is reunited with none other than Amos himself. Hiro meets Kathy, another knight who brought home the girl Hiro saved, and she knows all about his heroics. Amos is annoyed that Hiro is so chatty, so he forces him into a practical match. Bob and Kathy cheer him on, however, Hiro still fails to realize that physical attributes mean everything. Amos knocks away his sword, and Hiro covers his head and cowers in fear. Everyone witnesses firsthand just how weak he is. On the other hand, Granada easily defeats Amos, who prematurely ends training for today. A crowd gathers around Granada, and when Hiro tries approaching Bob and Kathy, they both leave him. Hiro is completely ostracized, but Riona reassures him that it'll just be for five days. He prepares to sleep, and when Riona offers to sleep with him, he turns her down. The next morning, Hiro groggily wakes up, but panics when he learns the others are already training. He rushes to the training grounds and sees that Granada commands total respect from both Amos and the other recruits. In contrast, Amos tells Hiro that he isn't cut out to be a guard 
completely like a fish out of water. Granada and Paolo push him around, but thankfully, Kathy appears willing to teach him how to properly hold a sword. The next day, a practical exam is held, but Hiro is unfairly matched up against Granada. Hiro manages to dodge a fatal blow, and he attempts to strike his larger foe with as much power as he can. Granada easily parries it and kicks Hiro in the gut. Amos declares Granada the winner, and Hiro is laughed at by his peers. Granada encourages him to quit already. Hiro laments that, even in a video game, he is the object of ridicule. Riona brings Hiro to the local counseling office and convinces him to seek help. After Hiro tells the counselor his troubles, he blames Hiro for joining the city guard without any martial skills. He diagnoses Hiro with skill issue and suggests that he quit. Outside, Kathy tells him that when she feels troubled, she prays. Hiro heads to the local church, and the nun senses there's a lot of sugma on him, which necessitates a cleansing. She leaves and returns with a giant basin of holy water. She splashes it all over Hiro, and the cleansing is successful, I think. Hiro exits the church and shivers from the cold, and he hopes that his fortunes will finally change. The next day, nothing has changed, and Amos tells him to perform practice swings forever. Granada and Paulo attempt to extort money from him again, but Rihanna suggests that he might be able to defeat Paulo, the weaker of the two. Hiro challenges Paulo to a duel, but he is far more skilled than his appearance would suggest, and he goes prone and surrenders. However, Paulo continues beating him up, forcing Kathy to call Amos over. However, when he arrives, Granada and Paulo pretend they were just helping Hiro train. Granada asks about the nature of his relationship with Kathy, and he claims that they are friends. Granada asks her if this is true and unwilling to be bullied as well. Kathy renounces her friendship with Hiro. Riona reassures Hiro that there's only one day left of this misery, but he's already at his wit's end. Riona decides to show him her fairy powers. The next day, Granada's boots go missing, and they discover them in the sewage drain. It was a gift from his grandmother after Granada became an adventurer, which makes this personal. Later, his greatsword, adorned with a dragon hilt, goes missing. They search everywhere for it but find nothing. Bob tries to give Granada a pep talk, but he doesn't want to hear it. However, he later discovers his sword crammed down a toilet bowl, and when he pulls it out, it is covered in, you know what. He accuses Hiro of being the culprit, but everyone points out that Hiro wouldn't have had the time to, and he also spent all day searching with them. They hear the head nurse scream, who claims that her underwear has been stolen. They discover it stuffed in Granada's bag, and public opinion turns against him. They make it clear that they want him out. He attempts to leave with Palu, but even he turns against Granada, and he is left friendless and maidenless. Hiro doesn't know what to feel about a grown man crying alone. The next day, Amos announces that Granada has left the guard for personal reasons. Suddenly, Tesla arrives, holding a letter that says Amos is responsible for stealing Granada's belongings, and it was signed by Palu. Tesla has heard rumors that Amos was a poor instructor, and he asks the recruits if he is fit to lead. Not one of them speaks up in his defense, and Kathy reveals that he, Granada, and Palu were bullying Hiro. She also admits that she and the other recruits were also to blame. The recruits are remorseful for their actions, and seeing that nobody bothered to defend Amos, Tesla relieves him of his position as instructor. He leaves and tells everyone to wait for a new one. Kathy and the recruits apologize to Hiro. Later that evening, Riona proudly reveals herself to be the true culprit, and Hiro tells her that she went too far. Tomorrow is the day of the goblin assault, and Rion asks him if he is ready. He replies that he'll try to get as far as he can. Seeing that he is serious, she decides to come clean about why she is going to such lengths to get him to play Q1 Quest. Riona reminds him of how she'd like to marry the player who beats Q1 Quest. She recounts that, 10 years ago, she saw Kamui and tried asking him out. He tells her that her chest is freakishly big. That's why she pulled a Megamind and decided to raise another player to beat Q1 Quest so that she could kiss them in front of Kamui as revenge. Hiro doesn't even know how to respond to that. He later meets Tesla, who can sense that Hiro also wants to leave the city. He feels the same way. Hiro suggests that they leave the city together, and Tesla considers it, but only after they beat the goblins. Hiro logs out and catches Cade staring at him. She was worried that he might have died in-game since he wouldn't answer the door, and Hiro is surprised that she cares about him. Realizing how embarrassing this is, she tosses the game box at him and marches off. Later, Hiro goes through Kamui's tutorial again. After he inputs his current title, Kamui tells him about the secret behind Q1 Quest. Hiro remains a little too long on the site, and Kamui says he shouldn't depend on walkthroughs forever. Hiro loads back into Q1 Quest. Tesla introduces two more temporary fighters, Misa and Alicia. Riona tells him that the girls he meets will join him during these special events. 
Hero remarks that if the Goblin Club doesn't kill him, a fruit knife will. Tesla informs them that there is unrest in the town due to the impending invasion. He instructs Hero, Alicia, and Misa to scout the eastern side of town. While patrolling the streets, Misa finds being with Alicia creepy. Hero tells her she's quite creepy herself. A thief suddenly bumps into Hero, but Alicia stops him by cutting his arm off. She tosses the stolen purse and chopped hand to Hero, who attempts to return it. When the lady sees her bag with the chopped hand, she passes out. Misa interrogates the thief. They notice that more of the town is descending into chaos as looters pillage stores and homes. The man points them to the local casino, where the mastermind is hiding. Hero discovers the casino filled with captured hostages, and they spot a scary-looking man in the back room whom they assume must be the boss. While Misa and Alicia take care of the thugs, Hero rushes over to free the hostages. Here he meets Jinji, who also happened to be taken prisoner. However, Jinji is revealed to be the true mastermind, and he threatens to snap off Hero's neck unless Misa and Alicia leave behind their valuables and get out. He reveals that he instigated the chaos to make himself a nice profit on the side. Hero thought that he and Jinji had come to an understanding. But Jinji says a friendship born from a fistfight is only in serial dramas. Hero breaks free, and he tells his allies to back down. Ginji is his business. Jinji has another ace up his sleeve. Double brass knuckles for double the power. Riona loses it. Jinji lunges at Hiro, but Alicia's patience wears thin, and she kicks him in the gut. Jinji allows himself to be taken prisoner. Hiro notices that he seems calm, and he says prison means a free room and free food, so it's all a matter of perspective. As he is led inside the prison, Tesla comes and congratulates Hiro. Suddenly, the clanging of empty pots and pans signal the arrival of the goblins. Hiro feels his stomach grumble, and Rihanna encourages him to use the bathroom first. However, while taking a massive dump, he is discovered by a goblin. Hiro cries out for help, but Rihanna ignores him. The goblin's head suddenly lops off thanks to Misa, who hoped to catch a glimpse of Hiro in action. Hiro thanks her for her help, and she asks to see his sword. She lightly stabs his leg, and he yelps out in pain. She invites him to continue, reasoning that it won't be all pain. She offers to let him touch her as much as he wants. Before he gives in, Alicia knocks down the door. The two girls square off, and Hiro slips away. He reunites with Riona, who was busy trying to deal with her split ends. Hiro snaps at her and asks if she wants him to beat this game or not. His stomach begins acting up again, and he remarks that it's just a repeat of before. She asks him about his past, and she promises not to laugh. Hiro tells her his story, and she laughs. Hiro really wants to give her a good smack. While arguing with Riona, Hiro's stomach calms down. They hurry to the north gate, where Tesla has assembled his troops to battle the goblins. However, as they charge into battle, many of the guards die. Tesla defeats many of them with his lightning-based abilities, and when Misa and Alicia arrive, the battle swings in their favor. Hiro watches in a mix of awe and fear as he watches Misa chop up and torture goblins while Alicia stealthily assassinates them. An injured Kathy and Bob arrive to report that Queen Govern's estate has been breached. Kathy remarks that a massive goblin, one eye, was among them. Tesla returns to the estate with his guards, while Hiro tends to Kathy and Bob. She tells him that Amos and Palu fled the moment they had the chance, and she implores him to help Tesla. When they arrive at the estate, Hiro spots a massive red goblin that looks more like an orc. Tesla explains that this monster is one eye, the king of the goblins. He explains that years ago, he scuffled with the mad beast and barely managed to escape while nicking him in the eye. And he asks Hiro if he is ready to defeat one eye and leave the city. Tesla engages one eye in a magnificent clash of metal, while Hiro nervously draws his sword. Misa and Alicia, who have made up somewhat, tell him to sit this one out. However, the moment Misa gets close, one eye kicks her into a wall, and she loses consciousness. Alicia leaps in and dazzles one eye with her speed. Moments later, a guard wheels in a cage filled with goblin children, which is Tesla's plan to distract one eye. It works, and he manages to inflict a nasty wound on the red goblin's chest. Things appear to be going smoothly, and Hiro wonders if Kimmy was exaggerating the 0.1% success rate. However, Kimmy would never exaggerate. He thinks hard about all the times he heard screams coming from the prison dungeons. He realizes that the goblins in the cart weren't recently captured at all. Based on their pale skin and blindness, they've been in the darkness for a long time. Rihanna tells him that this isn't some Detective Conan or Knives Out mystery story, but Tesla abruptly cuts off One Eye's head and confirms this as the truth. It was he who stole these goblin children all those years ago. Queen Govern descends from the steps and joins Tesla. She explains that their city of Ted is a nation isolated from the rest of Aberdeen. 
Tesla adds that goblins are an intelligent race and don't normally attack unless provoked. He realized he could use their anger to his advantage and keep the citizens of Ted from ever leading the city. Tesla and Govern kiss, indicating their relationship is more than just a ruler and her fair knight. Tesla kills his men to ensure the secrets of Ted stay hidden. He then turns his thundering blade to Hero, who realizes why the success rate is 0.1%. Hero, who can't even be a goblin, prepares to face off against Tesla, the strongest NPC in the game. He shows off a move at a higher level than his usual lightning extreme, lightning extreme despair, a flash of lightning moves to strike Hero, but Alicia shields him with her body. She is mortally wounded, and her final words to Hero are words of regret. She explains that Martin came to her in a dream, asking her to forgive Hero. She says she was happy that he said he wanted to marry her, truly, truly happy. She dies in his arms. Tesla remarks she was only delaying the inevitable, and he prepares another lightning extreme despair. To his shock, Hero parries it, and Tesla writes it off as a fluke. He attempts it again, but Hero appears to be doing it on purpose. Words cannot express Riona's shock. In a flashback, can we explain to Hero that a trait of Kiwain Quest is its pursuit of absolute realism? There are times when a boost of adrenaline can allow someone to perform superhuman feats. The same is true in-game and in reality itself. Hero's sword strikes become superhuman, and he pushes Tesla to the brink. Riona cheers him on and offers to marry him after he wins. Hero glares at her and says he has little desire to marry her. He thrusts his blade into Tesla's armor, but his sword shatters. Tesla brings down his golden blade on Hero's head, and he fears that his console will break. When Hero opens his eyes, he meets Martin's spirit. He apologizes for letting Alicia die, but Martin says it isn't over yet. He asks Hero to take him with him. A green hue makes up for Hero's shattered sword, and this time, it is Tesla's golden sword that breaks. The guard captain takes a step back as Hero's title becomes Sword Best Friend Killer User. His cursed magical sword glows brightly. Tesla prepares to use the ultimate form of his lightning extreme skill, but for the first time, Hero feels like he can do this. He rushes in and meets Tesla head to head. Minutes later, Hero lies in bed. He can't believe that, at the last moment, Govern would jab his legs, causing him to die. His console and game fried up. Over the phone, she tells him that no other person has ever gotten this close, and she offers to lend him a console and game for free. Hero asks for some time to think about it. He notices that there is a new entry on Kinui's tutorial site for people who lost at the last second. He clicks on it, and Kamui mocks and taunts him for being a masochist for wanting to play Q1 Quest again. However, he tells Hero of a trick to resume play from his old save file by inserting the old game cartridge, chanting a stupid incantation, and inserting a new save file. He explains this method to Riona, who isn't too sure about it. Hero wants to try again, but this time, he wants to prepare for it. He straps on his old running shoes and begins training to beat a video game. He'd forgotten how much he loved running. A month passes, and Cade's opinion of her brother improves. At school, he presents himself more assertively to Mr. Yasuoka, who agrees to wait a while longer on his career choice. Takafumi laughs about this in class. He is approached by Tanis and Machina, who ask if he is training to beat them up or something. Hiro experiences a flashback to Tesla's smug face, and he blurts something about gouging his eyes out. Tanis and Machina don't want to mess with a guy who's bringing a gun to school, so they leave him alone. Later, while Hiro waits for Riona, he dozes off on a park bench. He dreams of meeting Kamui, whom he accuses of also having had his console fried. Kamui laughs and says he has no idea what he's talking about. Hiro wakes up after Riona stuffs her chest into his face. She asks him if he's ready. Later that evening, Hiro prepares to boot up Kiwen Quest yet again. This time, he's ready to beat the game that's even worse than real life.